Hey guys, Michael Sanchez, violin teacher here. Welcome to today's violin technique class. So throughout this class, we're gonna be going through all student questions and hanging out with my cat Snowflake, who's probably gonna terrorize. <laughs> um, so there's tons and tons of questions. I'm excited to get through them all. So I just wanna give you guys sort of the structure of today's class so you guys understand what we're gonna be talking about. So at the very beginning, we're gonna talk about for the first sort of 10 minutes or so, uh, beginner violin questions. We have quite a few of those. Uh, we're going to cover after that some intermediate questions and some you could consider uh, advanced questions. And then at the very end, I'm going to actually talk about the group classes, which uh, we've been getting a lot of questions about that as well. So it's going to go beginner violin, intermediate, group. So sort of 10, 10, and 10. Hopefully that will work out like that. I'll try my very best. Also, I'll try to take a few questions at the end as well. Um, if you guys can comment on this post, I'm also going to be giving away a finger finder tool like I did earlier. Um, these are really cool. They help you to be able to read music. So um, if you guys are watching right now, you have a chance to win that. All right, so we're going to start with sort of some basic questions, and I'm just going to say uh, each person's name and um, who asked the question. So uh, Jesse asked, uh, what violin are you going to be playing in tonight's class? Um, so yeah, I'm actually going to be playing a uh, European violin. Uh, this is actually a Miguel violin, which is on our website. Uh, very beautiful. It's similar to um, the Topa as well as the Kowalski. It's sort of a reddish varnish instrument. So that's what I'm going to be playing today. Thanks for that question. Uh, Carrie Adams asked, I have yet to hold a violin, but my interest is growing. What is the most important thing to keep in mind when learning to play the violin? Thank you for that question. So yeah, basically the biggest things uh, that I highly recommend that people understand is just that you have to understand that's a mindset. You know, uh, it's, it's a journey, you know, learn the violin is not just something you can just learn overnight. So a lot of students just sort of, you know, cut themselves short because they just don't really uh, understand it's a journey. So that's the biggest thing I would sort of think about, Carrie, um, when it comes to playing the violin. And then I would also just really think about how, um, how much, how many techniques are important to learn, all the fundamentals. I actually have a really good violin checklist. Um, if you guys have never gotten that from me before, you can email me at michael at superiorviolins.com. I'd be happy to send you the checklist. It has about 30 things that you know you technically could think about when you're first playing the violin. And if you just work on a couple of those things at a time, you'll see really good progress. All right, next question is from Priscilla Gaskins. Priscilla asks, my question, does it damage the violin to take it to the beach? What about just outside in general? Very good question. So uh, I say, um, you know, as long as it's not, you know, any sand gets in the instrument or gets on uh, the varnish or inside, obviously, that's, uh, th then it should be fine. I used to play a lot of um, wedding gigs, and we used to do those always outside. Um, you never want to leave your violin in the car, like, for a long period of time, especially in this uh, really humid conditions that we're getting lately. So I highly recommend just you guys, um, you know, don't leave your instrument in the car. And, yeah, be encouraged to play outside. It's fun. Um, a lot of times I don't like to use necessarily a really expensive bow as sometimes, you know, a bows can sort of break easier than, you know, other things. Um, carbon fiber is really nice for playing outside. I recommend that. So great question. All right. Uh, now the sort of uh, actual technique questions we'll go through. Uh, first one is actually from Priscilla. Priscilla asks, uh, what is the proper position of the body when playing the violin? Very good question. So, yeah, when students play the violin, a lot of times they're sort of slouched forward. Um, or maybe they're too relaxed sitting back. You want to just sort of be on the very edge of your chair, very comfortably. You don't want to, you know, be any bit awkward. Just like if you were just, you know, at your most natural position of sitting. Maybe sit at the very front of your chair. And then um, as far as holding the instrument, try not to do anything unnatural. You know, you just, you just want the, the chin to come down to where it's pinching with your shoulder, but nothing should really be awkward with your neck or your head changing. You should be able to hold it with no hands. But right now I'm in a very relaxed state. There's no awkwardness. So um, the way that I sort of teach it is that we square our shoulders to the music stand, and then we try to point the scroll about at the left side of the music stand. So we don't want the violin way off in left field. Try to have it square, but don't change that based on your shoulders so that's what I always tell students very good and just a small break here if you guys post a comment you'll have a chance to win a finger finder tool at the very end of the class the first 10 minutes of this class is more beginner technique 
Uh, next 10 minutes is going to be more intermediate. And then the final 10 minutes, I'm going to sort of talk about the group classes, which hopefully you guys are all really excited about. All right, the next question is from Angela. Uh, Angela asks, I'm new to the violin and was wondering, what is the simplest trick to string crossing on a song? Very good question. So the biggest thing is just, um, you know, string crossing is all about the technique and the elbow. So, you know, as I come down from, say, the D string to the A string, I want it to come down all together. I don't want to change strings with my wrist. I definitely want everything to sort of come together. So that's a really bad habit I see students do often. So it's sort of the way that I explain it to a lot of people is it's sort of like it's a stick shift in a car. So, you know, you sort of want to get that stick into the right gear, right? Same concept as you're trying to get into the right string plane. And that's done a lot with what you're doing in the elbow. Okay. So when I'm on the G string, the elbow should be just above the instrument. On the D, it should be about even with the instrument. On the A, it should be below the instrument. And on the E, it should be right at your side. A lot of people, what they do though, is they have a tendency to sort of do it gradually as they're playing. See how my bow is moving and I'm moving my elbow gradually. That's not as effective. It's gonna cause bow bounces, inaccuracy, and not hitting other strings. So my suggestion would be for you guys to first change gears, then start the bow stroke. So here's, here's a, I'm gonna to try to do it wrong the first time, but it's hard because I'm so used to doing it right. But sort of this is wrong. See, I'm doing everything sort of at once. I wanna do this. Like that, hope that helps. All right, next question is from Terry. Uh, Terry asks, what is the best way to learn rhythm on the violin? So, great question, Terry. So yeah, uh, everybody is in a totally different boat when it comes to learning rhythm. Uh, this is sort of hard to give you a general answer, but the biggest thing is that you wanna be aware of working on rhythm. I see so many students you know, that you know, play the violin by themselves, they're solo players, you know, they learn self-teach themselves, and they never play with anybody else. And people like that tend to actually really struggle when it comes to rhythm because if you play by yourself, it is what it is, right? But if you play with somebody else and you're trying to put those parts together, that's more challenging. So my advice for you guys would be to use a metronome, tap your foot as much as you can, and just try to have an awareness of, you know, what sort of rhythms are in the piece. Are you doing eighth notes right now? Are you doing a dotted quarter note? Um, you know, and try to, if you're not sure what that means or, you know, that's sort of, what is that? Um, ask people that understand music. Um, you can ask me, you can email me. Uh, I'd love to help you through that. But yeah, rhythm is a very important part of playing any musical instrument uh, and definitely on the violin. Great, the next question is from Rasha. Rasha uh, asks, as a beginner, how could I find the right finger positions on the fingerboard but using any tag or without using any tags? Very good question. So yeah, technically uh, this is a really common question. Should you use stickers on your violin? Um, or tags as you're saying. So it sort of depends. I actually highly recommend stickers because it gives a visual um, a visual aid into where your fingers should go. And any advantage you can have to play the violin is really good. It being that it's a fretless instrument, it's not easy to just know where the fingers go. So I encourage stickers, but what, when it can get wrong is if you rely too heavily on stickers. So if, you know, I, I'm playing violin, say, for three years and I still have my stickers, and every time that I'm watching the music, um, I'm always coming down and looking at the stickers, <clears throat> that's not good. But for the first, say, six months, you know, I think it's a lot better to sort of rely on them to make sure that you're doing it properly, you're not going too far or too low. Um, technically, somebody that has a better ear, I think, you know, I would potentially recommend for them not to use stickers if they really have the ear for it. So, you know, it sort of depends on that, I think, but you never want to rely too heavily on it. So that's the consensus. Good question. And uh, yeah, as far as where to put stickers, I have some really good resources on that for you guys. If you guys email me at michael at superiorviolins.com, I can actually explain exactly you know, what stickers to use and exactly how to put the stickers on on the instrument 
which could help you to know, you know where they go exactly. Awesome. All right, let's go on to the next question. Bill, Dulcimer Bill, asks, uh, can you provide tips related to intonation on fingering F sharp G and C sharp D? Great question. So uh, Bill or everybody else watching, uh, F sharp G is basically second finger on the D string uh, high away from the one and then third finger right next to it is your G. And he's asking basically the same thing over on the A string, which is C sharp and D. So the biggest thing, Bill, is just understanding obviously that space, but it's all about having those finger angles back. So many students, they sort of reach for that second finger like this. See how it's sort of like I'm changing my finger angles as I'm putting that second finger down. And now they're out of position for that three, sort of awkward. Technically, guitar is, is played more like this, whereas violin is actually supposed to be played like this with fingers down. So my advice for you guys would be to not move the hand once you do the four steps of left hand position. I'll go over those right now with you guys. Step one, thumb. Okay, make sure the thumb's in the proper spot. Okay, it's about an inch away from the nut. And it's gonna be exactly where your first finger intonation should go. Step two, making sure the hand is back. Okay, we don't want our hand to be here, we want our hand to be back. Okay, step three is making sure the hand is high. Okay, my thumb is still there. Okay, step four is hand turn, about an inch away from the fingerboard. Once we're in this position, now I just let my fingers fall. Okay? So many people do all these crazy things once they get into that position and they think that it's them sort of reaching or trying to find it. It's, you know, force. And that's, that's where you guys are maybe going wrong. So four steps. One, two, three, four, drop. I can find every note on the vinyl. I can find my low one on the E string. I can find my fourth finger on G. Uh, if you guys are more new to playing, it might uh, just be, you know, you got to build a little bit of flexibility. But for the most part, it's all about finger angles to be able to find your notes. Great, next question. Uh, let's move this along. We have from Carmen. Carmen asks, I'm hitting most of, I'm hitting most of the notes uh, and bowling is still not that great. Not sure if tension is correct and if I'm using too much rosin. All right, looks like you need to watch my beginner lessons on YouTube. <laughs> That's going to sort, sort of give you all of, a lot of those things that you're sort of wondering about. As um, I talk about technique, I talk about setting up the hands, I talk about how much rosin to use. Um, so yeah, I'll give you guys the link to that. It's um, youtube.com slash violin tutor pro. Uh, just click on the video link and, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, playlists. And my beginner violin lesson playlist is really good. It's got 200 plus videos, uh, sort of takes you from the very beginning and uh, that's a great resource. So. Uh, I'll cover one of those for you though, Carmen. Um, as far as rosin, I talked about this in the last technique class, but we kind of take our finger and swipe at the bottom, and that sort of tells us how much rosin's on our, on our bow based on what's on our finger. And that sort of tells me if I need more rosin or if I should take some off, which technically can be done by flicking the back side of the hair, not the front side, never touch the front side. And that sort of gives you less rosin. So. Hopefully check out my playlist on YouTube. All right, next question is from Paul Clark. How are you doing, Paul? Paul asks, when watching you and other experienced players, I noticed that the bow hairs are not square flat on the strings and the angle of the bow to the surface of the strings changes. Uh, yeah, so he's wanting me to elaborate on that. So yeah, um, technically, if you guys watch me really closely, I probably tilt the bow often um, technically, as a more advanced player, that does create less of a dynamic. So if I'm trying to play really loud, I'm sort of trying to, you know, have those hairs have direct contact as much as possible with those strings. You know, I might just slightly tilt my bow, you know, to sort of get a little bit less dynamic like this. I might tilt. But as a beginner, I wouldn't recommend for you guys to do that as um, it sort of can build a bad habit a little bit of just being able to hit the strings, uh, the bow hairs, squarely on the strings. 
So yeah, highly recommend for, for you, Paul, if you've been playing Sander five years, probably not to try to do that yet. Although eventually, if you guys have been playing longer, it's definitely a way to do um, lighter dynamics. Great, next question we have from Carol. Carol asks, uh, how does one decide when to use up or down bowing? When I play by ear, it sometimes it's hard to uh, figure out. Great question. So yeah, technically in music, you actually have the bow marking. So you have the uh, table symbol. You guys know what a table looks like. <laughs> table symbol is a down bow, and a V symbol is an up bow. So when you see a down bow, it means that you're gonna move your bow from this position downwards towards the tip. If you see the V symbol, the up bow, it means you're gonna move it upwards towards the frog. So uh, obviously with reading music, it's sort of just based on what's in the music. Uh, normally every beginning of a measure is typically down bow. Uh, if there's a note sort of before the measure, it's called a pickup note, and that note is typically up bow. So there's sort of these sort of rules that, you know, violinists tend to get to know. Um, the, the purpose of bowings is just, you know, if you end up playing an orchestra, it's good to, you know, have that sense that you can, you know, know what direction you're going so that everybody's bow is moving in the same direction. And, and I'm sure you guys have seen that if you've gone to an orchestra concert. So uh, that's a good thing to learn. So as far as playing by ear, it's sort of one of those things where, you know, people that play by ear all the time don't really think about bowings as much or need to. Um, so I would just maybe not think about it that much. Um, Beginning of a song, start down bow. <laughs> All right, next question. I believe it's from Beverly. Beverly says, uh, sometimes with pre when practicing, I realize that I've hit a note a little too high or a little too low. Should I stop and start over again, or should I keep playing and hope to hit correctly the next time? Great question. So yeah, basically, uh, you know, let's say you're a little bit off with your intonation. You go, you know, here instead of, you know, you're supposed to be here. And technically, that's a big difference. Uh, Beverly, I would recommend trying to adjust, but adjust with just your fingers and not your hand. I see that all the time with students. Students that are off tend to try to get back to place, but they're doing it forcefully with everything they have but everything should be done in just the fingers. So let's say I play an E to an F sharp. I'm a little flat here. It's supposed to be, but let's say I'm, okay? So I can adjust that, but I'm not gonna move my hand at all. It's gonna be just like this, okay? It's not gonna be, or whatever, I can't even do it. <laughs> so hope that helps. All right, uh, next question is from, let's see, Marlene. Marlene says, hello, I'm new to the group and plan on attending class tonight. I've just recently started teaching myself violin, so I still have a lot to work on. Right now I notice the sound is scratchy or screechy. Uh, what can I do about that? So yeah, it's all about um, just uh, tension management. Uh, as far as, you know, are you gripping the bow too tight? Are you using too much arm in the bow stroke? Are you not bending your wrist enough? Are you, you know, just doing things that makes the bow really tense? That's going to be what's probably causing your screechiness, your bow bounces. I have tons of resources on this. Um, if you guys don't know where to go or can't find it, email me at michael at superiorviolins.com. We'd love to help you. As there's so many things that are to say or to learn regarding uh, tension management and um, avoiding screeches and bad sounds. So, great question. All right. Um, Looks like we're almost through the beginner questions. Um, let's do one more here from Debbie. Uh, Debbie says, left hand position. Should the left hand be turned so that the palm is facing the fingerboard or should the palm be facing the player? So you're talking just hand position, um, Debbie. So yeah, I talked earlier about those four steps. I think that would probably help you as technically you're turning the palm to where you're in this position and then just sort of letting the fingers fall. So yeah, hope that explanation earlier helped you. All right, so uh, just a little recap of kind of where we're at right now. So we're giving away a finger finder tool at the end of this class. Uh, to anybody that posts a comment, uh, post a comment about you know how much you're enjoying playing the violin, how you're really excited about the group classes. Um, is anything that you're interested in? I'll probably answer a few questions at the very end, although I can't uh, probably get through all of them. 
I'll try to have my team and if me if I can answer them after the after the show so also I will be hopefully posting um, a document of all the questions that I'm looking at so you guys can also just sort of see what was covered in the class today all right this is our next sort of segment the intermediates so anybody that's you know playing um, a little bit longer say three years this might be more in your ballpark of questions all right first question is from Andrew can you show us the second and third position, please. Very, very good. So yeah, first position, obviously here. Um, third position is where basically my third finger goes is where I'm gonna replace with my one. So I'm gonna take my thumb, my whole hand is gonna move together and it's gonna basically land right where my three is. That's third position, okay? Being able to do that consistently and accurately takes practice, um, but it's a lot, it's a lot of relying on holding the instrument properly and not grabbing the instrument too tight. Everything sort of just comes up. I can feel how far that distance is. Second position technically is actually in one of two places. It could be potentially where your low second finger is, or it could also be where your high second finger is. Technically that's a sort of the same concept with third, but let me just show you. So commonly you could shift the second right here where the two is, okay? Then basically a low two is your one, two, three, and then four. So it's basically one half step or one whole step above first position. Uh, sometimes you have to shift in second position up to the high two spot. So instead of shifting here, you're shifting to here. And now it's high two, probably half step uh, where your three used to be, where three used to be. Three, four, most likely a, a half step from there. So, so yeah, you have third position, which is very common, and you also have second position. When do you do these? It depends on the situation in the song. Uh, a lot of times uh, you're gonna see a certain fingering based on staying on the same string, and it's really, really good to know those positions. Eventually, uh, there's actually 11 positions on the violin. They go all the way up to here, believe it or not. If I just play you guys a, a scale that goes pretty high. <coughs> So like say um, E major. So that's shifting into third position. That's fifth position. Now seventh position. That's ninth position. Now 11th. That's high. So yeah, that's a three octave scale, E major. Uh, a lot of scales can go that high, and it's just um, it takes practice to sort of learn all the positions. So I encourage you guys out there to eventually learn at least third, second, fourth, fifth, eventually seventh and ninth and eleventh, all in between. Awesome question. All right, let's go to the next one. Naomi asks, "What are some good vibrato techniques to make it clean and consistent?" And with the index finger flick of the bow hand, do you have to flick in every bow stroke or just the beginning and end to create a smooth start and finish? Great question. So yeah, regarding your first part of the question, some vibrato techniques. A lot of students, when they do vibrato, they don't think as much as they should about the right hand. So, you know, as I'm doing this in the left hand, they're thinking that nothing really matters what I'm doing in the bow hand, but it really does. So a lot of times students can kind of quench up their right hand when they're doing certain things in their left. So I highly recommend for you guys that are maybe struggling with vibrato that are just thinking all about the left hand to start thinking more about the right hand, okay? So everything we talk about, about keeping the thumb curved, the pinky curved, the wrist bent, um, you know, just overall not grabbing too hard, the thumb not pressing up against the bow, these are things you still have to do as you're doing vibrato. But now if I quenched up my right hand, I might be thinking it's the left hand, but actually it's the right hand. So I encourage you guys out there to think more about the right. Uh, the second part of your question, uh, just you know, regarding the index finger. So yes, definitely every single bow stroke, every direction change, every sort of push and volume change, I'm definitely relying a lot on what I'm doing in the front of my hand or the index finger. So uh, that, that applies to when I'm doing vibrato, it applies to what I'm doing when I'm shifting. Uh, really, uh, you guys might be surprised just how 
simple the violin is uh, in some ways and that nothing changes as you start to progress. And I think a lot of people think, you know, as I start to learn shifting and vibrato and all these new things, that like I have to learn different things. But truly, playing the violin is as simple as very simple finger placement, not overpressing on the fingerboard, bending of the wrist coming up bow, not grabbing too tight and pressing up against the bow, and nothing changes. As you shift, you just do that. That's all that's happening. Okay? Um, as you're doing a vibrato, that's all that's happening. I'm still pressing lightly. I'm still bending my wrist as I'm doing that. So there's a lot of simple concepts regarding playing the violin that you guys might be surprised about. Um, you know, I always like to play like a really hard concerto for the violin and just watch my left hand, how it doesn't do much. So minimal contact. You guys are pressing too hard. You're causing tension. You're making it harder to move. You're making it harder to do vibrato. All these things just make it really challenging to achieve all the things you guys are probably trying to achieve. So really focus on minimal pressure, press down, and focus on more on the right hand, just different things. Nothing changes, the index still uh, guides the bow. Awesome questions. Next one is from Kim. Kim asks, does a trill start on the note or above the note? Sort of depends. Um, I typically like to do it right on the note, start and then go up. But I've seen it both ways, like as far as different styles of music, so that's a great question. I would just do it right on the note and then go up. That would be what I would do. Good question. Ashley asks, how do you make sure that when you transition over to the E string to play an open E and avoid the high-pitched squeak? What is the proper way to start a new piece of music uh, by counting it, clapping it, or just start playing it? So the first part of your question, Ashley, um, a lot of times, if you guys are getting a really, really high-pitched squeak, let me try to do it. Oh, bow here. I can't even do it. But whenever you get that really high pitched squeak that's way higher than the actual E string, it's, it's called a whistle, okay? And when that happens, it's actually caused because there's too much tension in your arm or it could even be just in your hand that's making the E not be able to function properly. So whenever you start getting that, try to focus on actually lowering your elbow position closer to your side, um, more extension of the arm, not shoulder into the E string. There actually is a, a string out there that prevents whistling. It's called the Kaplan Solutions E string. So, um, what was your name again? Ashley. Uh, you might want to consider that if you just sort of want to get rid of it, don't want to see, ever hear it again. But ultimately, it's going to be just about working on your technique. Great question. Uh, as far as how to approach a piece of music, um, lots can be said about that. Um, lots of stuff, resources I have if you want to email me um, as far as how to practice, how to do different things. So. Uh, email me at michael at superiorviolins.com. All right, um, we have a few more questions here and then we'll get into some group class stuff. Uh, the next question is from Robert. Robert asks, how can we use the metronome to improve our rate of vibrato? So yeah, you can definitely do that. Um, I, I don't think it's necessary necessarily. I mean, really, working on vibrato is all about you know management of the hand, not pressing too hard on the fingerboard. Um, you know, just go a certain speed where you're able to keep that last wave in there. So, you know, if I'm going too fast, but then at the end of it, I sort of flatten it out. So instead of going that last one, I'm doing, okay. Then I need to slow it down. I need to go more. One thing you should, guys should try to do is focus on the very edge of the finger as you're pressing down. I find that actually helps a lot with my fourth finger vibrato. When I'm just aiming on the very, very tips of the fingers, that allows me to get a better vibrato because it's hard to do sometimes with the four. Okay, now if I was focusing more on sort of hogging the string instead of being on the tip of the string, I would have a harder time with fourth finger vibrato. 
hog the string instead of here. This is harder, it just creates more tension. So uh, hopefully that helps. Uh, working on vibrato is just all about practice and uh, I have a lot of great drills I could give you guys um, if you email me and uh, I'm sure they'd help if you just work on them every day for say 18 days. I normally tell students it takes about 18 days to really build solid muscle memory with vibrato and a lot of other things. So great question. All right, uh, Julianne asks, I would like to have Michael review the different kinds of bowing techniques. Oh boy, this may be a session of its own, yes. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of different bowing techniques, uh, a lot of books that cover a lot of things. Um, I highly recommend you guys to, to practice etudes. Etudes are so helpful in just working on different bowing techniques. Uh, Wolfart, Mazas, Kreitzer, um, Sit, uh, Sebchik. Uh, these are all really good books. Technically, they're all in the public domain. You guys can get your hands on them for free. I have a really good resource on, my, on our website at violintutorpro.com that actually has uh, links to all those free uh, etude books. So if you guys are interested in that, you can email me, michael at superiorviolins.com. I'd love to send it to you. All right, so uh, we're sort of in the last little part of our class here. If you guys post a comment, you will have a chance to win a, a um, finger finder tool. So what's really cool about these are, you know, let's say you get a piece and you're in the key of B flat major. So I can sort of maneuver my card over to B flat major. And now all of the finger spots are updated accordingly of where your fingers would go. Now let's say I go to a piece or I even have a key change into, let's say, A major. Now it's going to update it and show me based on the sliding of the card. So when you guys are going to win one of these tonight, good luck to you. All you got to do is comment, and I will give you uh, a finger finder tool. Um, if, all right, I got to choose you, obviously. Can't give it to everybody. <laughs> I don't have that many. All right, so uh, really great. There's a lot more questions that uh, we're going to be covering tomorrow, by the way, guys. Um, Wednesday at 9 o'clock Eastern. So um, just log into Facebook Live. You guys can post more questions today and tomorrow. And uh, my my violin teachers are doing so well. They're they're just awesome people. They're post they're sort of organizing the questions for me. Um, they're answering some of them as well. Uh, we have a great community going of teachers. Just uh, awesome clan. Um, really knowledgeable people. There's some of them are watching right now probably. Um, and we're trying to just sort of build this community of you know violin instructors and violin students and sort of bring everybody together. So, you know, we got somebody that's, you know, maybe in Iceland and you got somebody down in Australia. Obviously, it's tough to find maybe a teacher in each of those areas, have a lot of options. But, you know, with the Internet, with group classes, we can sort of start putting that together and start getting some of these people uh, great instruction. The one thing that's sort of lacking at this moment is that we don't have sort of the, the structure. OK, so, you know, you guys might be watching random classes on YouTube. You might be watching, you know, random stuff. Uh, or just thinking you know exactly what to do, but you, you might be sort of lost a little bit. So group classes, I think, are going to sort of solve that. You're going to be accountable, sort of have an assignment. Um, you know, the teacher is going to suggest make, maybe some scales for you to work on, an etude book, um, maybe have a goal of a fiddle piece to learn. So I sort of developed this spreadsheet. It has all these different, you know, um, options, things that a teacher would sort of fill in. You know, this is what I want to do in this class and then people can sign up for them. So that's sort of what we've been trying to do and set up the last um, few days. But it's not technically set up yet. Um, we're sort of you know, talking to the teachers. We actually have a meeting this Friday at 4 o'clock for all the teachers, and we're going to sort of just discuss all this feedback you guys have been giving us and just sort of try to put it all together. Um, but I have technically created a document you guys can check out. And I'm really excited just to you know, start the, the process of getting these going. So uh, I have a bunch of questions uh, from uh, some of the teachers even. Um, so I'm going to sort of go through those and at the very end we will give away this finger finder tool. All right, the first question. Um, can you give an overall vision of these group classes? Sort of what I did there. But yeah, the overall goal would be that you guys are able to, you know, get efficient with the violin. Not just be a violinist, but, you know, like with working out. You know, it's sort of like having a personal trainer. It's like, you know, it's good to have the ability not just to randomly lift weights and do what you want to do and come when you want to come, it's much better to actually have a routine, to have a, you know, step one, step two, you know, I think that's, that's really is going to help you guys out 
Um, so ultimately, it's going to make you guys better players. And uh, you'll meet some cool people, I'm sure, along the way. We have awesome community out there. So about 40 of you guys are watching right now. And I'm excited for you guys to sort of start meeting each other and um, getting to know each other. So it makes it fun. All right, the next question is, how long will each class be and how often are they going to happen? So each class, I think, should be about a half hour, I think. Uh, going longer than that is possible, but that's what I would propose to start. That's what I'd propose on Friday to the teachers. Uh, I used to do Google Hangouts in 2013. I got really into those, and half hour is sort of a good medium. Uh, I recommend for you guys to just attend one class uh, per week. Uh, that's sort of the frequency. Um, but, you know, it's just sort of whatever you want to do. Technically, if you really want to do more, you could. Um, that's all in, in talking phase, but you know, at least once a week I think would provide sort of accountability to you guys and give you guys something to practice. Next question, is there a schedule you're following? There is a spreadsheet that has sort of the setup of what it would look like to sign up for a class. So um, you guys can hopefully share, some of my teachers watching right now, hopefully you can share it with the rest of the clan that are watching right now. Um, but basically that sort of has my initial Oh, I just had to miss my wife's call. <laughs> By the way, just real quick, I wanted to tell you guys, the reason why my video is backwards is like it's on my phone, and I, if I put it the other way, um, technically I think that would solve it, but then I won't see if somebody calls me. So if you, guys, if you guys can help me with that, I'd really appreciate it. Scott Adams actually said he's gonna try to help me with that. <laughs> so that's why you see me playing the violin backwards and why my ring is on my other finger. So it really is, and it's on my left hand, so. <laughs> okay, so. Um, will you need your violin for these classes? Um, yeah, I highly recommend for you guys to bring your instruments. Um, some people are gonna be sort of opposed to like being on video, I totally understand that. Technically, you could just be on audio, just like talk to the teacher and talk to people to start. Um, you can even just watch, technically. Um, but yeah, I encourage you guys to you know at least have your instruments eventually. You know, for those out there that get comfortable, you could eventually play for each other. There's going to be uh, ten people, up to ten people in a class, most likely a lot less to start. So you you're sort of get to know each other. Um, I've had some great group classes over the years, and it's fun. You know, like you sort of build on each other. So you know, you kind of come into it thinking, oh, I'm terrible. I, I there's no way I'm ever going to be able to play violin and improve. And the next thing you know, that that person's sort of same you know they're not that advanced either and it sort of builds some confidence you know you sort of feel like yeah you know I'm I'm at a normal point for one year experience or whatever you know so I think it's it's a confidence builder you know especially perfectionists out there that sort of feel like you have to have it perfect to, to do anything like this I mean this is not a performance this is sort of this is actually like a private lesson but it's done in a group and it's organized by a teacher um, and it's the next best thing I really believe to a private lesson so um, technically the cost of it is really gonna be affordable we're gonna talk about that more on Friday um, I wanted to probably link in somehow to the violin tutor pro membership um, as a lot of people are already paying money per month to have access to my videos um, so they should at least get a discount um, for you know these group classes but we sort of have to pay the teachers a certain amount for it to make sense for them too so we sort of have to have this happy medium so that's sort of what we're in discussions in right now, but your feedback is very much appreciated. You can comment on this post if you want um, to sort of give some feedback or email me, us. Um, we're excited to meet on Friday and just talk more about it. All right, uh, next question. We're almost done, by the way, just a few more questions and we'll give away this finger finder tool. Is, if I can't watch the actual online group class, can I watch it later? Absolutely. So. Uh, we're thinking about doing you know, Google Hangouts, which is in conjunction with uh, YouTube Live. So after every class, you guys are gonna be able to um, see it later if you, can, if you didn't make it. They're all gonna be in the Violent Tour Pro membership area, obviously. Um, we can't post everything on YouTube, otherwise then you just get it all for free. Um, so, but yeah, that's all stuff we're gonna sort of talk about with the teachers on Friday. But yeah, you definitely will be able to watch it later, especially if you're, you're, uh, you know, you paid for the class. Um, we're thinking about doing the first lesson free for everybody, so you guys can sort of get the hang of it and sort of what it's all about. Um, that's sort of what we're thinking. But uh, you know, I'm open to whatever you guys think. Um, 
so yeah, the first one would be sort of the preview, what we're going to be doing. You know, this is the goal. You know, technically you guys could come in with no webcam, just want to watch, you know, this is how it's going to potentially go and is this something for me? You don't have to like expose yourself and here I am into the world. You know, it doesn't have to be like that. So um, Google Hangouts is a great tool. Uh, for teachers it's great. You know, students can be muted if they're, you know, talking too much. <laughs> no, it doesn't happen very often. Um, just they have manageable tools in Google Hangout to sort of, you know, if somebody comes in late, that's where the meeting thing would happen. Um, they're automatically muted so they're not interrupting the class and stuff like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's a great way. It's a great structure. Would I be told ahead of time if I need books? Absolutely. So that uh, spreadsheet actually is going to have like everything I think that a teacher would want to tell the student. So that includes books, that includes links to, you know, um, you know, a scale resource that, you know, a lot of stuff might be free. Most of it will be. Um, but yeah, if you need a certain book, like a Suzuki book, uh, we'll have links to that. Um, but yeah, technically it's not required. It's just, you know, we're going to be studying these songs or whatever. So, um, but yeah, teachers are welcome to even do classes just on vibrato or classes just on shifting or technique. So in those cases, then maybe a book wouldn't be necessary, but they will have those pot potential links right there. Um, in that spreadsheet. I think we're running out of light here. Can you guys tell that I'm getting darker? Um, good. All right. Let me just do one more question. Um, I think I'm running low on time as well. And um, then we'll give away the, uh, the finger finder. Okay. Uh, the last question I'm going to do, do we need to sign in to the members page to get instruction? Uh, would there be a link to join the class? Great question. So basically that spreadsheet will have a link to um, the actual class. So you just click on it, you go right into the class and you're able to actually start interacting. And what I was thinking is what we could do is a half hour before the class starts uh, is when you guys could actually come in and sort of mingle and get to know each other. Uh, I, I see a lot of people get really into that. Back when I used to do the Google Hangouts back in 2013, uh, there's like just a clan of people that just love to just come in early and just get to know each other. It's fun. Um, you don't have to do that, but um, I encourage the teachers to open up the class, have a link ready for the students a half hour before, and then you guys will be able to, you know, mingle, hang out, just be general, you know, hey, uh, how, how's your violin progress going? Because that wouldn't be as appropriate during the class, right? So that would be before and right after as well. So, um, yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of success with that. All right, let's give away this finger finder tool. What do you guys say? So I'm going to give it away to a random person that's here and um, good luck to you. So I'm just going to sort of pick a random comment and uh, that person will be the winner. Good luck. The winner is, want to help me post? <laughs> my wife just got in. I just told her, to... you want to pick for me? I'm super sweaty. Oh, you're super. Okay. My wife's going to pick it. Um, no, you got to, you got to close your eyes. Oh yeah. Close my eyes and okay. scroll. Yeah. Yeah. Just pick one. Ready? Don't look. Just okay. look away. Ready? Right there. Carl Hazel. Carl, <laughs> congratulations. You just won. Vibrato takes practice and time. That's the one we just picked. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, uh, congratulations to Carl. Hope you email me about uh, your winnings. Michael at superiorviolins.com. He just won a finger finder. So I'm super excited for this group uh, class concept. All the teachers are excited. Uh, we're going to keep you guys updated. We're going to have a class tomorrow again at 9 o'clock Eastern time. Um, so hopefully you guys will be there and post some questions. Uh, give us a list. I actually didn't get through all of them today. I'm sorry if I didn't answer your question. I tried as fast as I could to talk as fast as I could. <laughs> but I also don't want to have it be too long of a class. So, um, But we'll see you guys tomorrow. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you guys have a great night.